Tonight, President Biden's fiery State of the Union address kicking the 2024 election into high gear. Biden's commanding an energetic speech in effort to reassure Americans he's ready for a second term. Biden hammering former President Trump, referring to him only as my predecessor. The president going off script and on the offensive, sparring with Republicans. The heated moment he took on Marjorie Taylor Greene over the border crisis. And our Peter Alexander going one on one today with Vice President Kamala Harris, pressing her on the possibility of the president meeting Trump on the debate stage. Also tonight, deadly airdrop, a parachute carrying desperately needed aid to Gaza, failing to open. Video showing supplies plummeting to the ground. Gaza's health ministry says aid crushed and killed several people in the war-torn area. The tragedy highlighting the urgency for other methods to deliver supplies. The new details on President Biden's plan to build a port as the humanitarian crisis grows. Mass stabbing horror. A 19-year-old student accused of stabbing and killing a family he lived with. The only survivor, the father, wounded in the attack, now grappling with the loss of his entire family, including a newborn. What we know about a motive and how the rampage in Ottawa, Canada is shaking the region. Tornado danger. This monster twister caught on camera as dangerous storms charge across the south. Nearly 30 million on alert for life-threatening flooding, torrential rain, and hail. Bill Karens is standing by to time it all out. Plus, gorilla scare, a terrifying situation as a silverback gorilla charges zookeepers trapped in the animal's enclosure. What the zoo says went wrong and how both were able to escape unscathed. And buzzer beater battle, a referee's call costing a New Jersey high school basketball team a shot at the state championship. The team taking their fight to a judge, hoping a winner will be determined in a court instead of on one. Top story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. Tonight, President Biden basking in the glow of a powerful State of the Union address, now the launch, the launch pad, rather, of his re-election campaign. A defiant Biden coming right out of the gate, blasting former President Trump, referring to him only as, quote, my predecessor. The president taking Trump to task for the January 6th insurrection, saying you cannot love your country only when you win. President Biden spending much of his speech talking about abortion rights, the economy, immigration, and the Israel-Hamas war. Throughout his address, Biden welcomed opportunities to spar with Republicans, including the stunning moment he took on Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from the lectern over an alleged murder by an undocumented immigrant. The president's address receiving high marks in a CNN poll today, showing 65 percent of Americans watching the speech had a positive response. But that number lagging behind ratings for Biden's previous addresses and coming amid historically low approval ratings for this president. Biden today shifting into campaign mode, visiting key battleground states, hoping the momentum from last night's address propels him towards a second term. Our Peter Alexander spoke with Vice President Kamala Harris today about the speech and whether it won over voters concerned about Biden's age. Tonight, after a critical speech where President Biden took repeated swipes at his likely Republican opponent, Donald Trump. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. I think it's outrageous. And sparred with Republicans in the room. You're saying, no, look at the facts. I know... I know you know how to read. Vice President Kamala Harris tonight insists the president put to rest voter concerns. The 81-year-old is too old for another term. Did he answer those questions last night? He was absolutely on fire, and he answered any question that anyone might have. We also asked about Republican criticism of her readiness for the job. Listen, as it relates to me, I'm ready if necessary, but it's not going to be necessary. The president vowing to protect abortion rights. When reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. And slamming Republicans for rejecting a bipartisan border security bill at the urging of Mr. Trump. Republicans say President Biden could solve the crisis on his own by executive order. The former president told the leadership 
of the Republican Party in Congress don't put it on the floor for a vote because he has been very unapologetic and clear. He'd prefer to run on a problem instead of fix a problem. Given the Republicans aren't going to fix those problems with Democrats, why not do it by executive order? The American people deserve leadership that's about fixing problems. And that's why he's going to lose in November. We have a lot of work to be done, but let us not negate the role and responsibility of leaders in Congress. One of the most dramatic moments, Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene challenging the president to say the name of Lakin Riley, a Georgia nursing student. Police say was murdered by a Venezuelan migrant who crossed into the U.S. illegally. Not really. I... The president then picking up a button Green gave him. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. After Mr. Trump this week challenged President Biden to debate any time, anywhere, any place, the president today would not commit to one. It depends on his behavior. We pressed the vice president. I haven't talked to the president yet about that, but I'll tell you something. On the one hand, you've got Joe Biden, someone who is competent, who is principled. And on the other side of that split screen, you've got the former president who glorifies dictators and has said he'll be a dictator on day one. Will you commit to a debate? It, look, Peter, we just got through with the State of the Union, and I am just so excited about what we accomplished last night and our president. And Peter Alexander joins us now live in studio. Uh, Peter, as you noted in your report, the former president, current Republican leader of the party, if you will, mentioned a lot in Biden's State of the Union address, even though it wasn't exactly by name. Trump himself watching this closely, I think commenting on Truth Social as it went. What has his reaction been to this? Well, you're exactly right. President Biden not mentioning his name, but referring to his predecessor 13 times in that address last night. The former president was reacting in real time on his social media platform, describing the president as being angry and crazy. Today, he said that he was senile. Republicans, though, they've also been very critical of this speech. They said that it was hyperpartisan. Those words from Speaker Mike Johnson, the top Republican in the House, also described it as divisive. In a lot of ways, Ellison, this is sort of the starting gun this week for the 2024 general election campaign. President Biden already on the road in Philadelphia tonight. He's going to have an aggressive travel schedule this month. I'm told hitting five swing states in the next seven days. So that moment with Marjorie Taylor Greene, where she was calling at him, telling him, yelling to say the name of this nursing student, Lakin Riley, who was murdered in Georgia, and the president got her first name wrong, calling her Lincoln Riley. What has the reaction to that moment within the Trump team and Democrats been? Because that is something that you never want to get a victim's name wrong, right? We talk, we do those stories on air all the time, too. That is a horrible thing to accidentally do, even if it was inadvertent. What's the reaction? There? Well, we heard from the vice president on this. She said that there was a lot of back and forth in that moment, that the president was trying to demonstrate empathy to the family of Lake and Riley, of course, the Georgia nursing student who was killed. Police say it was at the hands of a Venezuelan migrant who crossed into the United States illegally. But we are hearing from Lake and Riley's own mother, Allison Phillips, who on social media said to others, she said that it was, quote, pathetic mm. that the president didn't know her daughter's name. Mm. All right. Peter Alexander, thank you. We appreciate it. For more on Biden's State of the Union address and a look ahead to the general election campaign, I'm joined now by our political pros of the night, Michael Starr Hopkins, Democratic strategist and the president of Northern Star Strategies, and Mark Lauder, former strategic communications director on the Trump 2020 campaign. Thank you both for being here. We really appreciate it. So, Mark, let's start with you. Democrats, as Peter was just reporting, they are praising Biden's speech as a massive victory for him. He laid out contrast between himself and Trump and then focused more specifically on his own record. You had Senator Katie Britt giving the Republican rebuttal. According to a report in the Daily Beast, some Trump team operatives are describing that rebuttal speech as, quote, one of our biggest disasters. Break everything down for us from last night. What did you see? 
Well, I saw the, the president come out right out of the gate of the speech and not direct, uh, address the number one or number two issue on the minds of the American people, being the economy, skyrocketing inflation, or the crisis at the southern border. He led with Ukraine and sending billions of dollars to Ukraine, but not talking about securing our border, building a wall, and, and preventing what we saw happen with Lake and Riley and so many other uh, examples of immigrants who have come here and committed crimes, sexually assaulted young women. Uh, and so I thought it was out of touch. And I thought it was an angry speech. There was a lot of yelling. And I don't think that's the way you're going to uh, attract many uncommitted voters. Michael, same question for you. What did you see last night? I saw a president that's ready for the 2024 election. Uh, the election officially started last night, and President Biden took it directly to Republicans. For the last three years, Republicans have said that President Biden was too frail, that he was senile, that he couldn't perform his duties. Well, he showed up last night and made the case, and not just uh, reached out to the American public, but really talked about principles. It's awkward to hear Republicans talk about the president being too mean or too hyper-partisan when in Trump's last State of the Union, he gave Rush Limbaugh the Medal of Honor. It's laughable, and I think the American public sees it. Mark, Biden blasted Trump and congressional Republicans for blocking that bipartisan border bill, accurately pointing out that the Senate bill was written with conservatives. It would be the most significant immigration reform in a generation if it was actually passed. Trump does not want it, right, fearing that it'll be a political win for Biden, and he put pressure on Republicans to not move forward with that. Could that strategy backfire? I mean, securing the southern border, it is a major part of Trump's political brand, but he is blocking a possible fix to the current crisis. Is that a political liability for him? Well, first off, that's actually not true. The, pres uh, the, the Speaker of the House called that bill dead on arrival long before the president got involved. Where I worked during my day job at the America First Policy Institute, we rejected that proposal weeks before the, uh, the president came out. But the president's not wrong because it doesn't actually fix the border problem. It actually makes it worse by allowing 5,000 legal immigrants in per day until it actually shuts the border down. It legalizes catch and release. What we need is H.R. 2, which the House of Representatives passed eight months ago and now has bipartisan support. As you see, John Fetterman coming out and saying the Senate needs to take up this bill. That would actually reinstate the Trump policies that worked to secure the border. Michael, we saw the Biden campaign release a statement this week telling supporters of Nikki Haley, Trump doesn't want you, but there's a place for you in my campaign. Uh, respond a little bit to some of what Mark was saying, the idea of Biden's speech last night being hyperpartisan. Why didn't he make a direct appeal to those Haley voters? Do you think any way that that was some sort of political fumble? No, I think the president was making a speech to all Americans. This wasn't just a speech to Democrats. It was making a, a case for principles, which is something that we've lost in this country uh, in the wake of Donald Trump and his presidency. I wrote a column this week for The Hill where I talked about the fact that Nikki Haley should uh, appeal to Americans by becoming a write-in candidate as a protest against Donald Trump. She uniquely understands the threat that Donald Trump is to this country. And so I think that Nikki Haley and her supporters uh, would find a very great coalition at home with the Biden campaign. Mark, what should the Trump campaign be trying to target or focus on in the days and weeks ahead after a speech like this? No, I think it's very simple. You need, to fo you need to focus in on Joe Biden's record. It's one thing he did not have in 2020. He was basically a hypothetical president. He's a real president now with a real record. Two-thirds of the American people think we're on the wrong track. Two-thirds of the American people oppose his policies on the economy, on immigration, on crime, on just about every major issue facing the voters. So if you remind people that we had more money in our pockets, prices were lower, you were safer at home, our border was secure, and the world wasn't at war, you win this race hands down. Right. Like, if, if, Michael, yeah, quick. last question to you. You can respond to that. I was going to ask you the same question. What should the Biden campaign be focusing on in the days and weeks to come? And that idea of a debate, any advice yeah. for the Biden campaign on whether or not he should do it? 
Look, this is a question of, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Four years ago, we were in the middle of COVID. The country was shut down. The economy was in a spiral. Now, 15 million new jobs. We have a cap on the price of insulin. The economy is roaring back, and we're now fighting for the women for women to have the right to choose. We are better off than we were now, and Republicans want to take us back. And you can show that through abortion. All right, Michael Starr, Hopkins, Mark Lauder, thank you both. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And heading into that general election, Donald Trump still marred by a myriad of courtroom controversies. His latest legal woe, a $91 million bond. Trump posting the bond and filing a notice to appeal in the E. Jean Carroll case. The bond necessary to prevent Carroll's attorney from trying to seize Trump's assets while he appeals a New York jury's $83 million defamation verdict. A lot of numbers there, a lot of cases, but luckily we have NBC legal analyst Angela Sinadella with us in studio now to talk about all of that and Trump's looming legal battles. Okay, so let's start with the bond there because it is, it's a lot of numbers and it's just a lot of money and hard to keep track of why post this if you're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Break it down for us. I mean, how long could the appeals possibly last here? So the appeals process will definitely take months, not unheard of to take over a year. But look, as much as his team might claim that this verdict will be overturned on appeal, it is a long shot, Ellison. Appeals always are. And look, this was a defamation trial, which means that the jury really decided this based on the credibility, their determination of whether or not E. Jean Carroll was lying and any other witness on the stand. Those types of issues are not even considered on appeal, not whether or not she was lying or how credible she was. So I don't see a real easy appeal, an issue that could be won here. Okay, but he could just run, I guess, run the clock out as long as he wants, right? But he's paying for that with his legal team is that sort of the theory as to when when would the appeals possibly stop can you just keep going and going oh no, no yeah. the, the appeals process will take yeah. months okay so the, the appellate gotcha. court will hear it it's just slow it's so they, just have to, okay. they have to file briefs and they have to okay. oral arguments etc got it okay good okay so let's turn now to his civil fraud case this is in the new york appeals court a judge denying trump's request to post a 100 million dollar bond instead of what his attorneys call an impossible 464 million dollar penalty they say he won't be able to put up the full amount without selling off some of his properties uh his this decision it was against trump as well as his sons and his company in that case what is next? Okay, so he got this rush hearing in front of one appellate judge mm -hmm. who decided that he had to put up the full amount. $100 million was not enough. Now, his next step is to ask for the five panel of judges, mm -hmm. all of them to also hear his case. But if they deny his request on March 25th or before then, he has to put up over $500 million. But in this case, even though I just said appeals are obviously very hard to win, yeah. I, think he, I think he has a little bit more of a chance. Okay. And that's because the judge here really applied the law in ways that has never been applied before, which means there's more openings for appeal. It's never been applied before against a person versus a company and also a case where there are no victims. Interesting. Okay, so this last one to touch on is the U.S. District Judge that is planning to hear arguments on two of Donald Trump's motions as it relates to the classified documents case against him. That is in Florida, but it's being led by Special Counsel Jack Smith. Uh, Special Counsel Jack Smith urging that judge to reject Trump's sweeping claims of presidential immunity. His office writing this in a legal filing that, um, quote, his claim that obviously presidential records, highly sensitive government documents bearing classification marks that were presented to Trump during his term in office can be transformed into personal records by the alchemy of removing them from the White House is false. Um, Smith essentially saying Trump's claim here and with the Supreme Court would mean presidents would not be held legally responsible for basically anything that they did or may, or would do post. How strong of a rebuttal is that? And what do you expect the judicial response to be here? So Jack Smith's argument there mm -hmm. is very strong. And this yeah. is all in the context of a motion to dismiss. Mm -hmm. So defendants always will bring a motion to dismiss. But in a case like this, it's almost very unlikely that it will survive or that it will that it will actually be dismissed. Prosecutors don't bring cases which they believe will not survive these motions. So 
In this case, I think that that argument is very strong and that we will see this case move forward. But his biggest enemy, Jack Smith, in this case, is time. Because mm. they first wanted a May trial, then a July. The judge there said July is still too early. Mm -hmm. and so that takes us closer and closer to the election. If this trial does not happen and Trump assumes office again, he can make it all go away. How long could the motion to dismiss be in limbo, I guess? Like, would we get a decision on that pretty quickly? Yeah, we'll okay. get that decision pretty quickly. But then after that, every piece of evidence mm -hmm. has to be examined by the judge. And in classified documents cases, these are exceedingly rare. Judges don't have a lot of history or experience with this. They have to look at every piece of evidence and decide what can Trump's team see, what can the other team see, what should be admitted. So that's why this pretrial process should be very long. All right, Angela Sinadella, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We turn now to the forecast and the tornado danger in the heartland. A severe tornado warning uh, storm that is tracking across southern Kansas. The massive wall cloud, you see that there, is looming over the city of Coffeyville. Those storms still threatening the Midwest and Southeast tonight. So let's get right over to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins us now. So, Bill, what exactly are you monitoring? Where do things stand in terms of the latest track? Yeah, the tornado watch still issues for the rest of this evening, but I'm more concerned with flash flooding and what's going to happen during the overnight hours. But we'll start with the tornado threat. That goes until 9 o'clock. We have our tornado watch still from Mobile to Biloxi, up here and right along the border of Mississippi and Alabama. We haven't had any official confirmed tornadoes yet. We had at least one or two tornado warnings earlier. Flash flooding has been a problem all day long in Mississippi. Hattiesburg, you're under a flash flood warning. You had some really strong thunderstorms earlier. And now all of this rain is going to head through areas of Alabama, and then it's going to head the Georgia tonight and a little bit of South Carolina. Atlanta, you are under this flash flood watch. Also, heaviest rainfall totals look to be from Atlanta southwards all the way down towards Albany, Georgia. Atlanta, maybe two inches. Columbus could get an additional almost four inches of rain. That's why we think significant flash flooding is going to happen right through the overnight hours. And then tomorrow, this whole mess is in the mid-Atlantic. Additional severe storms in the southeast. All our friends in the Carolinas, especially down through Georgia, that's where you could deal with storms. Then Sunday, we blow that storm out of here. So this is the area of, of risk of severe storms tomorrow. It's mostly a slight risk, damaging wind, maybe some small hail with these storms. Again, Georgia, Carolinas, North Florida. And then that rain as it moves in Saturday night, be prepared for that around New York City to Philadelphia under a flood watch in Philly. And then our friends up in Maine and New Hampshire also. Rainfall totals, another one to two inches. And this is on top of the one to two inches we just got a day ago. So everything's very soggy out there. And the high elevations, Ellison, a snowstorm. Everything's been melting so rapidly. Everyone's like, all right, Winter's over, but most of the mountainous areas are going to get 6 to 12 inches of heavy, wet snow and windy conditions. Could have some power outage problems, too. So, uh, yeah, kind of a nasty early spring storm. All right, Bill Karens, thank you. We appreciate it. Next tonight, the latest out of the Middle East. Five people were killed after a parachute with humanitarian aid failed to open as it fell in Gaza. This according to medical officials there. NBC News' Richard Engel has the latest. Uh -huh. This is what an aid drop into Gaza is supposed to look like. As today, a Jordanian military cargo plane dropped pallets of food near Gaza City. They fall slowly. But this also happened today. As the pallets are dropped by another aircraft, one of the parachutes on the right of the screen fails to open. The package comes apart in midair, the pieces falling down with heavy thuds. The other pallets also drop very quickly. Palestinian medical officials and witnesses say five people were crushed to death. To establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean. Last night, President Biden announced the U.S. military will build a pier to improve and expand the delivery of humanitarian aid. NBC News has learned it could take up to 60 days for it to be fully operational. But Washington also supplies Israel with weapons. Instead of telling us they will build a port to help us stop giving the weapons they use to kill us, this man said. We were on an aid drop yesterday as a Jordanian military C-130 flew over northern Gaza. We've just given the signal that they're ready to drop. The pallets carried tens of thousands of meals. Our crew filmed as hungry people went searching for food. As they searched, they approached Israeli troops because that's where the food aid was. Not long after, an explosion can be heard. And an injured man is taken from the area. The Israeli military says its troops have opened fire on those who appear to pose a threat. Gazans face an impossible dilemma. 
do nothing and go hungry and possibly starve, or search for food at the risk of being shot or hit by raining pallets. Ellison? Richard Engel, thank you. Still ahead tonight, massacre in Ottawa. Six people, including an infant, stabbed to death inside of their home. The suspect, a teenager on a student visa who was living inside the family's home. Plus, another airport mishap involving a United flight, a plane skidding off the runway in Houston. What we know about the 160 passengers on board. And from the basketball court to a courtroom, a high school basketball team thinking they won a playoff game with a buzzer beater, but the last minute basket was taken away by the refs. Now they're asking a judge to reverse the call. Stay with us. We're back now with a disturbing story out of Canada. The city of Ottawa reeling tonight after a 19-year-old assailant went on a mass stabbing spree, killing six people in their home, four of them children, the youngest victim just two and a half months old. NBC News correspondent George Solis has the heartbreaking details and the latest on the police investigation. Tonight, a devastated community in Ottawa, Canada is mourning after what police are calling the worst mass killing in the city's history. Six people, including a newborn, brutally murdered. Authorities say a mother, her four children, and a family friend were stabbed to death in their home late Wednesday night. The victims, ranging in age from 40 to just two and a half months old. This was a senseless act of violence perpetrated on purely innocent people. The husband and father of the victims was also injured in the attack, but survived now recovering at a local hospital where he's in serious but stable condition. The investigation has found that an edged weapon was used to cause the deaths and injuries. To be clear, this was a mass killing, not a mass shooting. The suspect, Fabrio D'Souza, a 19-year-old Sri Lankan national living in Canada on a student visa, arrested shortly after police arrived on scene. Dezoisa, who made a brief court appearance on Thursday, has been charged with six counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Police say the family was new to Canada, originally from Sri Lanka, and believe the 40-year-old victim and the suspect were living in the home at the time of the attack. Police telling Canada CTV News the landlord was not aware they were living there. The rare mass killing shocking the city of Ottawa, which has a population of 1 million and only saw 14 murders in 2023 and 15 in 2022. Ottawa's mayor, Mark Sutcliffe, calling it one of the most shocking incidents of violence in our city's history. Now, as police continue to search for a motive, the suspect is due back in court next week. Meanwhile, a vigil for the victims is planned for this weekend. Allison. George Solis, thank you. When we come back, trapped with a silverback gorilla. Shocking new video shows an ape charging at two zookeepers in Texas as visitors watched. The staffers forced to hide inside the enclosure. What the zoo says happened. That's next. We're back with Top Stories News Feed and another mishap involving a United Airlines flight. New video shows the Boeing 737 MAX 8 after it ran off of the runway at George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston. Officials say the plane's left landing gear rolled off the tarmac. 166 people were on board at the time, but luckily no one was hurt. It comes just one day after the wheel fell off of another United flight during takeoff in San Francisco. A scary situation caught on camera at a zoo in Fort Worth, Texas. Take a look at this. Video circulating on social media shows a silverback gorilla charging at two zookeepers inside its enclosure while visitors watched in horror. One of the staffers hiding behind a door. Luckily, they were able to get out unharmed. In a statement, the Fort Worth Zoo says the staffers mistakenly entered the enclosure while the gorilla was still inside. And George Santos announcing he's running for Congress again just three months after he was expelled. Santos, who is also facing federal charges, made the announcement as he attended the State of the Union address in Washington. He's not running for his old seat and instead will try to unseat a Republican in another district. In December, he was expelled from office in a landslide vote and is currently facing 23 felony counts. Next to a heartbreaker on the basketball court, now playing out in a county superior court. A high school team in New Jersey thought they had punched their ticket to the state championship with a buzzer beater, 
only to have that victory taken away minutes later by the referees. Their effort now having that call reversed before the clock runs out, they're going to court for it. NBC News correspondent Stephen Romo reports. It was a rebound just in the nick of time. And a putback that sealed the Manisquan High School basketball team's trip to the New Jersey State Championship game, or so they thought. But then the referees convened, waving the basket off, handing that victory to the Camden High School Panthers. The pivot, shocking. This video clearly showing the ball leaving the Warriors players' hands before the clock hits zero. But the reversal standing, sending Camden instead of Manisquan to the Group 2 state finals scheduled for Saturday. Manisquan's Board of Education taking the issue to a different kind of court, calling it an absolute travesty. Manisquan asking the Ocean County Superior Court judge to postpone the championship game until it can be resolved. For some unknown reason, after everyone was leaving the court, one of the referees changed the mind of the referee that made the initial decision. We just need to make that wrong right. But getting anyone to help with that has been easier said than done. Even after the second ref reportedly wrote to the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association to admit his call was wrong, the organization refusing to roll it back. In a statement, the association saying the rules are clear. Once game officials leave the visual confines of the playing court, the game is concluded and the score is official. The results could not then and cannot now be changed. The judge offering little additional help, ruling that the dispute is outside the court's jurisdiction. This case never should have been brought to the Chancery Division of the Superior Court. This is high school basketball. There's a rules and regulations. You have to learn to live with the decisions of a referee. I mean, it's all part of sports. In a last-ditch attempt for relief, Manisquan's lawyers asking the state's education commissioner to step in. But that request was denied as well. Now Manisquan appealing the judge's decision. But the clock rapidly ticking as the championship game they say they deserve to play in is still scheduled for tomorrow. And Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. So Stephen, that video seems to pretty clearly show a game-winning shot. What is the plan for this team moving forward to try and resolve this? Yeah, as we saw, they really went through so many different options, trying to think outside the box to find a resolution to this. Now they're really just waiting to see if that appeal for that judge's decision can actually go through. But time ticking down. Noon tomorrow is when that game is supposed to happen, the one that they would like to be in. Right now, the boys team actually is saying, Put all your support behind the girls' team. Go out and support them. They play at 2 o'clock tomorrow, so they're trying to throw that support. But right now, they're really just hoping something comes through. Stephen Romo, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. A new U.N. report finding Iran responsible for the, quote, physical violence that killed 22-year-old Masha Amini. Back in 2020, Amini was arrested by Iran's morality police for allegedly not wearing a hijab. Her death while in custody sparked widespread protest and international condemnation. The U.N. also calling Iran's response to the protest, quote, unnecessary and disproportionate with at least 500 people dead and more than 22,000 detained. The former president of Honduras has been convicted of drug trafficking here in the United States. A jury finding Juan Orlando Hernandez guilty today after a two-week trial. In closing arguments, prosecutors saying he, quote, paved a cocaine superhighway to the U.S. from Central America. He's the first former head of state to be convicted of drug charges in the United States in more than three decades. The 55-year-old now faces 40 years in prison. And a special partnership celebrating female hockey players this International Women's Day. Beer company Molson unveiling these new jerseys for the Professional Women's Hockey League. The players' names will appear at the bottom of the jersey instead of the top, which is often blocked by their hair. The company says it's a way to provide more recognition for the players. The jerseys making their debut tonight at the Toronto versus Montreal game. Now to a rare look at the inner workings of China's often secretive government. Our Janice Mackey Freyer got access to the biggest political event of the year, the National People's Congress in Beijing. Though largely ceremonial, the legislative sessions provide insight into the Communist Party's plans for the upcoming year. Here's Janice with that report.
So this is Tiananmen Square. You've got the Forbidden City just beyond the buses, and on the western side is the Great Hall of the People. Now, this is all the top tourist attraction here in Beijing, but normally a foreign journalist like me isn't allowed to set foot here without special permission or during a big political event like what's been happening this week with the National People's Congress. We've got the accreditation. Let's go inside. It's called the Two Sessions, or Liang Hui. Thousands of delegates come from across China to get the Communist Party's blueprint for the year. But the meetings are closely watched around the world for clues or signals about where China might be heading, especially now with the economy losing steam. Um, it's, a, it's the biggest meeting in China. What is the important issue for you? Women's rights. Security for these meetings is tight. This is the first part of the security check. A barcode on my pass is scanned. Every vehicle is inspected inside and out by police and sniffer dogs. Going into the Great Hall, there's facial recognition and airport-style security. Through the door and beyond the curtain is where Xi Jinping and top Communist Party officials deliver what they call work reports. It's an assortment of plans and targets for the coming year. Let's be honest, there are no surprises that come out of these political events, which are predetermined and largely ceremonial, but for the outside world, for policymakers, business leaders, investors, they do offer a glimpse into what the Communist Party is thinking. In the famous auditorium, palm pageantry and symbolism, from the big red star on the ceiling to the officials on parade, even the tea service involves choreography. What happens down there and where people sit can reveal a lot about power dynamics within the party. This year, we noticed a lot more space on either side of Xi Jinping compared to other people on the stage and compared to where his chair was positioned in past years, putting him very much on his own at center stage. Yao Ming, the former NBA star, got his own row. At seven foot six, it seems he needed the leg room. One of the bigger headlines is what won't happen. They announced earlier this week they're scrapping the annual Premier's News Conference. And it was a shock because it's one of the few opportunities that journalists have to put questions to one of the highest ranking officials, though the events are highly choreographed. But also for people across China to hear the country's number two speaking openly about the state's affairs. The decision isn't going over very well, but a lot of the comments have been censored on social media because it takes an already opaque political system and makes it more of a black box and ends a decades-old tradition. We still needed a PCR test before attending, but unlike past years, there were few masks around and far more diplomats. China wants to send a message that it's back to normal, that it's open to the world, with one man more than ever in charge. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Ellison Barber in New York for Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.